got to switch tactics here. But that's okay. You can be seated. In Exodus chapter 33, I was reading this the other day, and it just, something really just struck me and caught my attention with it. And I'm just going to read from a different translation because it doesn't quite translate the same between that and the King James. But it's Moses having a conversation with God about wanting to see his glory. And I'm reading, and it says, One day Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You have told me I know you by name, and I look favorably on you. And he said, If this is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor and remember that this nation is your very own people. And the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. And then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably upon me, on me and your people, if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. I cannot escape that. As simple as that is. That simple conversation that Moses was having with God and how that translates into the life of a New Testament believer. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's fulfilling what he was telling Moses about there. But he fulfilled it in a much more grand way. For those of us that have been filled with the Spirit of God, that have been filled with the Holy Ghost, His presence is never going to leave us. And what sets us apart further than that is the power and majesty of the Holy Ghost working in our lives that people would begin to see the presence and favor of God in the children of God. Oh my God. What a privilege that is to know that the presence of God is moving with us wherever we go. People look upon us, and when we are walking right, talking right, living right, full of faith in the Holy Ghost, what people are seeing with us, what they saw with the testimony we heard tonight, that's just the tip of the iceberg. If we'll say, God, I want more of you. God, I want people to see you in me. His presence will transform us and transform the lives around us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is power in that name of Jesus. And he is something to get excited about. There's a lot of dead religion in the world today. And people can go to church and come home just like they, like, like they went. Unchanged. And to talk about it, it's just a normal conversation. But for those who have been blood-bought and purchased and infilled and walk with God in spirit, there is an excitement and enthusiasm about God. Amen? Now, I want to make an announcement. I've been uh, teaching Color Your Bible, and I went through the series, just finished it. <coughs> Some of the people dropped out because they did not know the books of the Bible. But I would like to do it again for those 
who might be slow. You say, I don't know the books of the Bible. We'll have them either posted for you or we'll have a copy of the books so you can look at it and find your scriptures. But if you would like to go through that color your Bible, that would be during the time of the second service on Sunday. Uh, and it will take the time to see that you find the scripture. You don't have to keep up with anybody. Uh, I'd like to see hands. Mm, I don't see any hands. No. Did we have one? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. And December is coming, and everybody's thinking about Christmas. But December the 21st on Sunday is our Christmas for Christ offering. This is once a year. It is the only funding that the General Home Mission Division has. Half of the offering that's collected here in the state from the churches will, will, leave, will stay here for the work of God in Illinois. And the other half will go into uh, the General Home Mission Division, and they will divide it among the selected missionaries, and uh, they will dispense with all of it. Last year, they raised over $3 million. Amen? And this church has always been a generous contributor to Christmas for Christ. Now, and if you're new and you've never heard the term, what we say is you buy a gift for everybody else and it's not their birthday. You're not celebrating their birthday. And you're giving a gift only to those that give you one. Did I say that? Is it true? It is true. You only give, and if you gave a gift last year and they didn't give you one, you, they get scratched off of your list. <laughs> That's kind of a pitiful way to celebrate what we call the birthday of our Savior. He came to his own, his own received him not. He gave it all, and that's why we can have the joy of the Lord. That's why we can get our prayers answers. Our bodies healed, our loved ones saved, our Bible studies to come and find the Lord because of Calvary. And so while we're saying we're celebrating Jesus' birthday, we give gifts to everybody, and he sits there in the corner and doesn't get a single gift. Let's change it. Let's give the biggest gift to Jesus this year. The kids, save quarters, dimes, anything, get your hands on. Anybody lays any money around the house, stick it in that jar for Christmas for Christ. Too bad. Finders, weepers, finders, how's it going? Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. It's going to Jesus. Now, if you want to take it away from Jesus, you can take it back out of that jar. But start saving your money for Christmas for Christ. And I, I will tell you this. Uh, my family was the first one to ever do this. We pastored in Madison, and we didn't have a lot of money. But we called our kids in, and we said, Now, uh, kids, this is approximately what we have to spend on you this year. Would you like to put some up in Christmas for Christ? And so they put half of their Christmas money in Christmas for Christ. My wife and I put all of ours, and we never, ever bought a Christmas present from then on for each other. It all went into Christmas for Christ. It's such a worthy cause. And uh, they buy buildings. They underwrite uh, missionaries to, to reach North America with this gospel. And we will be receiving that offering. We'll have a manger here. And uh, bring your gift to the manger and uh, drop it in there. And uh, you can put it in a box if you want. You can wrap it if you want. It would be nice to have it wrapped. 
and uh, we'll give it to Jesus. Celebrate it for the first time. I will tell you that first Christmas was back in 63, I believe. That first Christmas that my family practiced that, there was not a lot of presents under the tree. And because uh, the kids had given half of theirs and my wife and I had given all of ours. But I will tell you this, the presence of God came into that place. And we started to weep in his presence. That's what I always do and I feel the presence of God. Some people dance, swing on a chandelier, <laughs> do a loop backwards, and I weep. It was a beautiful Christmas. You know, I'd, I'd gone through so many. I remembered the, the Christmas tree, and I, I'm not against Christmas trees. I'm not preaching that. But uh, when Christmas was over, there had been so much stress and strain and buying gifts for the right person, the right kind, the right size, and and then getting it all done and ready uh, by Christmas time. And I can remember on Christmas Day for many years, as soon as the gifts were unwrapped, I grabbed that tea, tree, took it out in the backyard and burned it. I was so glad Christmas was over. Have you ever felt like that about Christmas? That's not a good way to celebrate. I'm glad the celebration of Jesus is over. So we get to the heart of it. And start saving your money. And uh, our first, let's see, there were two years that this church sent $30,000. We raised that much money. For Christmas for Christ. Uh, we do have not raised that much in a long time. And I'm not giving you a figure. But uh, sacrifice. And let's give to Christmas for Christ. Amen. <laughs> Last week we ended on Sardis. That is the fifth uh, ch church. In Revelation, that John is writing to, and with Sardis, God said, you've got a name that you live, but you're really dead. What does he mean? You've got a name that you live, but you're really dead. What he's saying is, you started off right. You had the fire of God in your bosom. You were a part of a prayer team. Lifting up your voice for the community, for their salvation, for the missions, for the work of God. But somewhere in the transition, you kind of cooled off and you're not so intense. And uh, in fact, you've really lost the power of God. That's what he's telling them. You had it and everybody knew it and you act like it now and people think you still have it. But it's not so. The fire has died. And he said, uh, uh, Revelation 3 and 4, Thou hast a few names in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Nobody can steal your crown. Now, we are going up as a church, but we're being judged as individuals. Belonging to a group is not going to assure you a place in heaven. He knows them that are his. And he will take care of them. You've got a few names that have not defiled their garments. They'll walk in white. The white is the righteousness of the saints. Now under the Greek culture years ago when they worshiped idols... They could not go into a temple and worship that idol with dirty clothes. They had to be clean. They couldn't approach that uh, idol even with soiled clothes. But now we're approaching the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. 
we're approaching the one that spoke to Job and said, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Who stretched a line on it? Tell me where the fasteners are of the earth. You know, it spins on an axis like something was holding it top and bottom. But people have been to the North Pole and the South Pole, and they never found a connection. Hanging out there in space, traveling through space at an astronomical speed around the Earth, it turns its axis tipped 23 and a half degrees. It turns 1,000 miles an hour, and it never varies. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. And you say, whoa, wow, wow, wow. No, 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 wow. There's billions of stars that are doing the same thing, all controlled by God. said, Job, if you know the answer to these things, tell me. Can you bring forth Mazaroth in her season or guide Arcturus with her sons? He said, uh, it went on to question the constellations, and Job just shakes his head. He, he, he can't even answer. He just looks at God, and he said, I'm vile. <laughs> I feel in your presence like I'm soiled and filthy because I, I didn't give you enough credit. But that's God. That's Revelation 3, 5. Here were these people of Sardis, he that overcometh. The same shall be clothed in white raiment. Oh, I want that. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. You want God mentioning your name up in heaven? Walk with him in righteousness and truth. These white robes, these white clothing stood for purity, stood for festivity. And most of all, for victory. They wore the victor's robe. When the old Roman soldiers used to go off to war, and sometimes they'd be gone a year or two years, and when they conquered the nation they went to defeat, they came back the victor. And this captain wore this white raiment, and they had built an arch of triumph for him. He came through this stone arch of triumph, and many of them still remain on the Appian Way there in uh, Italy today because they were conquerors. They put a wreath around their head. They were conquerors. They'd been to battle, and they had not lost. You can't lose in this battle if you walk with Jesus. The devil can't steal your salvation. He can't take the purity out of your life. He can't stop you from winning the war. Only you can allow that to happen. But when you're in a battle, you put on the armor of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, that out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. The shield of faith. Satan lies to you and you bounce his lie off of the shield of faith. I can't prove it by mathematics or English, but I know it's true because it's in the Word of God. You can lean on him. You can trust him. If you walk with him consistently, you cannot fail. We only fail... When we walk away from God, we get cold, and every day that goes by that you don't pray, you just take another step away from him. Yeah. So stay in the battle. Stay in the battle. Victory is sweet. <laughs> if you keep overcoming, your name stays in the book. What are you going to do? Overcome. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Sardis was not without hope. God said, I know you're not doing good, and I know you're dead, but I haven't turned you loose. If you 
walk with me and get a fresh start, you can be an overcomer. Doesn't matter who we are tonight or where we are with God. He does care about us. He doesn't say, I'm going to take you to heaven no matter who you are or where you are. But he said, if you'll walk with me and be an overcomer, I've got all these promises for you. There were seven different churches. He had a promise for every one of them. And then the Philadelphia church. Now that was the revival church. God didn't have anything bad to say about him. Revelations 3 and 7. And to the angel or to the pastor of the church in Philadelphia write, These saying things saith he that is holy, he that is true, that he that hath, hath the key of David, that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man opens. He said, I will give you the key to the treasure house. Hezekiah, the Jewish king in the Old Testament, gave this key to one of his trusted stewards. He had access to the king's treasury and all of the riches that were there. That's what God said, I will do for you. Amen. Now, Philadelphia was a border town. Three countries met in the corner there in Philadelphia. It was a gateway to the east. The Persian king, Artaxerxes, came by there, and he was going to Europe to invade it and to conquer the world. He found shelter. Uh, some of these uh, kings had some real idiosyncrasies. There was a large tree, and he so admired the tree that uh, there in Philadelphia that he left a trusted guard to guard the tree that made sure that nobody cut it down. This highway came from Asia right through Philadelphia, and it went toward Europe. The built was, uh, it was built to strategic. Strategically, I can do it. Because the Greeks wanted to spread their language. See, Rome conquered the world, but the Greek culture conquered the Romans. And the Greek culture was so influential. They wanted to spread their language, their culture, and their civilization, and especially to the barbarians of Phrygia. This was an open door for the apostolic message. It was a place of learning. And this Greek people had people eager to hear and to learn, which was just a ripe audience for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Philadelphia was famous for their wines, their grapes, and people everywhere came to bathe in their hot springs, but they had a lot of earthquakes. Anybody, any of you ever been to an earthquake? Ah, I've never been in one. I've seen the results. Years ago, I went. first time I ever went to Alaska, they had just had that big uh, tsunami and earthquake, and it was... Anchorage was quite a small town then. But downtown, you would walk on the sidewalk and you'd have to stop and walk around because there was a 10-foot drop. And it was just, it looked like some giant shovel had uh, thrown things around. So if you don't want to go through an earthquake. No. The people would flee. Their houses get torn up, torn down. And uh, they'd come back and rebuild them. The city was filled with temples. And these were pagan temples. But Philadelphia, Jesus gave his undiluted praise for Philadelphia. They kept the faith. That's what he said. Revelation 3 and 7, I just read that. But let's look at it again. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy and true, and hath the key of David, it openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. The Greek for the word holy and true was genuine. Genuine. Isaiah 22 and 22, 
22 and 22 is a similar scripture. And the key of the house of David will I lay up on his shoulders. So he shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. Revelation 3, 8. Home, same scripture, wasn't it? I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word. And has not denied my name. Praise God. Little strength means they were few in number. This was a special church, folks. Everybody who reads these stories of the seven churches wish that they were a part of the Philadelphia church. That's what we want this church to be. You see, this city was a missionary city for Greek culture, and now an open door for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God opened that door. Now the whole world is an open door because Jesus Christ is that door. He said, I'm the door. You can't enter unless you go through the door. He didn't say, I'm like the door. I am the door. The old shepherds didn't have gates. They laid, it was important to watch, and they laid in the would-be where the gate would be. And some of them were scarred because of the animals that tried to get to the sheep. But I'm the shepherd, he said, I am the door, and I know how to take care. So it was ripe for soul-winning evangelism and effectual prayer. This church cherished, Philadelphia cherished the word of God. They were bold in the identity of Jesus Christ. They were not ashamed of that name. Folks, if there's anything we want to do in our public life, we do not want to be ashamed of the name of Jesus. Sometimes they associate a lot of names with it. Are you a holy roller? Well, I've never rolled on the floor. But I do love Jesus. Amen. They were bold in the identity of Jesus Christ. He is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I, he is the first, the last, and everything in between. He is the door. Revelations 3.9. He's still speaking to this Philadelphia church. And behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they're Jews and are not, but they lie. And behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved you. said, these Jews are influential, they're political, and they're rich, and they're intimidating. But don't let them intimidate you because you're on the winning team and they're on the losing team. Know who you are and where you are, what side you're on, and who you got to help you. Don't let anybody in ever intimidate you. They were victorious and their tormentors were defeated. Revelation 3.10, next verse. Because you've kept my word, my patience, I will keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them to dwell on the earth. I will keep you. You say, well, how did people fail? They stopped putting their trust in Jesus. They drifted away. Their prayer life got very minimal and some, sometimes amounted to zero. But God promises that he would undergird us. Deuteronomy 33 and 27. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath. Boy you ought to mark this one in your Bible. Are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy before thee. And shall say destroy them. 
Underneath are those everlasting arms. Wow. In verse, chapter 3, verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. The crown is a victor's crown. Paul said, I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord shall give me on that day. Nice, Paul, but how about me? And not for me only, but for all them that love his appearing. All them that love his appearing. Praise God. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast that thou hast, that no man take thy crown. 3.11, the crown again is for the victor. 1 Corinthians 9 and 26 says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. He said, I know who I'm fighting, I know why I'm fighting, and I know what I want out of life. You've got to have direction. You can't just guess. It's Jesus, and I want to walk with him. I want to please him. There are things that we really would like to do that are not sinful, but they're not what God wants for us to get in our life. Amen. Uh, Revelation 3 and 12. Him that overcometh here again, you got the overcomer. Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? You see, the Greeks, when they wanted to really honor somebody, they put a pillar in one of the pagan temples and inscribed the name of the person they're honoring. And here's what he's saying. I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, with coming down from God out of heaven. And I will write upon him my new name. He said, it's very personal. I know who you are. I know the struggles you may have had. I know the battles that you may have gone through. But I also know the victories. And like I told you the other night, uh, we're, we're in a battle, but the war is not over. And won't be over until we lay our armor down. Now, if you're young and you think when you get old, you won't be tempted, will you think again? <laughs> Temptation will go to different things, but you will. See, the devil is sly. And he works on your mind. He puts thoughts in there. And you don't dare leave those thoughts there. Don't meditate on them. They are thoughts that appeal to the flesh, but not to the spirit. And you've got to be on your guard all the time. You see, the people of Philadelphia were accustomed to fleeing these earthquakes and returning. But the Christian, with faith, when you come face to face with Jesus, born again of the Spirit, embrace the Word of God as true, and take the Bible and write your name in the front and the back and say, I ascribe to whatever's in this book. Amen. Amen. Did you know that for a ship to survive a major storm, they have to face the storm? They get sideways, they're lost. They lose their motor. There was supposed there was predicted fifty feet waves in the Bering Sea this last weekend. Now that Bering Sea is right at freezing temperature most of the time. You wouldn't have a chance. But a ship gets sideways in 50-foot waves, 
it would bury that ship, flip it sideways, and you get it behind, and you've got to go whatever way the wind, and uh, you can't do it. You've got to face the wind. No plan B. Amen? No plan B. There's only one way. No matter what comes, no matter what goes, no matter what my best friend does, I am going to walk with Jesus. <laughs> Kings issued coins with their image and their names stamped on them. It's only right that we'd have his name stamped on us. The old song says, his name is engraved on my heart. From him I shall never depart. What a wonderful, wonderful Savior. His name is engraved on my heart. Praise God. Again, I'm not perfect. I made a lot of mistakes. If I live very long, I'll make some more. But I'm going to heaven. Made up my mind. And then Laodicea. I want to finish this and get into the real prophecy next session. Located on the river with the three roads connecting the town, it was the richest commercial center in the ancient world. It had banks everywhere. Many Jews lived there, and they brought prosperity wherever they lived. You know, they said they put a Jew down in a strange land, and he didn't have any money, he didn't have anything. And he said, just give me a wheelbarrow, and that turned me loose. And that's, that's how they operate. They'll go down the street. They used to sell old rags. He used to come down the street, down the alleys, pick up the junk, the, the steel and the copper that was thrown away there. But it wasn't long until they owned the store. And it, See, God blesses financially the Jewish nation. Everywhere they go, they prosper. Most of our big corporations are owned by Jewish families. So they brought prosperity to Laodicea. And the governor decided that they couldn't send any money out of Laodicea, and he made a law. And the Jews sent 20 pounds of gold to Jerusalem, which was normal for them. And he, he confiscated it. And the Jews took it to the Roman government, and the Roman government said, give it back to them, and uh, they can worship any way they want. So... They were free to follow their customs and the laws of the word of God. But the Christians were hated by the Jews. It's only normal if the, Christ, if the Jews hated the Christians. Remember, the Jews gave us our Messiah. They gave us our Bible. It was not only originally given to God, but scribes meticulously translated it wrote it down, and every copy of the Bible at the time of Jesus had to be handwritten. It had to be checked by several rabbis and scribes before it was accepted, so it had to be letter perfect. And here, uh, these Jews had brought prosperity, and uh, they were still trying to keep some of the law. They were free to follow their customs. Laodicea was a very wealthy center, a center for a lot of bank, banking in the whole region, but ravaged by an earthquake. And they had so much money that Caesar offered them millions of dollars to help rebuild. They said, we don't need your money. I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. They believed that money could buy anything. They didn't need God's help. They could do it on their own. And much of their riches came from the clothing industry. They raised a sheep that had black wool. 
that made very famous clothing. And it was famous. They said he was famous for his outer garments. And then they made a, a, a powder that they made into an eye salve. And they were noted all over Europe and Asia for this salve that was supposed to help the eyes. In Laodicea, they thought they had built a utopia. But they built it on common material things. Everything that is not of Jesus shall go down. It shall go down. It shall go down. And the name of Jesus shall prevail. No utopia on this earth. You can't build it. They've tried. Person after person has thought they could build a utopia, and it turned into nothing. But the only thing that's stable is the name of Jesus and the kingdom of God. These things are stable and they are eternal. Amen. So Revelation 3.14, under the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So God identifies himself as faithful and true and beginning of all things. John 1 and 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. You see, the amen in the Greek is verily, verily in our Bible. And it was true. The 15th verse of Revelation 3, here's what God says to this people. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. And so he goes on to say in the 17th verse, because you say I'm rich and increased with goods, and had of neither nothing, don't you know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? You see, God rejected the lukewarm. The, uh, the word hot here comes from the Greek word zestos, which means boiling hot, just not warm. And what they did, they let their business interfere with their religion is rebuked because they preferred respect, respectable morality to passionate religion. You know, it's easy to get excited about the Lord. Lukewarm means tepid, and prayer is the source of that hot. You're wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked, he told these people. They were rich. Prosperity blinded them to the need for God. When you're raised in uh, poverty or middle class or lower middle class, and you watch the riches of America and the people that seemingly enjoy them, it's easy to have ambitions for material things. God said they were poor. They were rich. They lived in beautiful houses. They had beautiful horses. They had beautiful chariots. They had parties and so forth and lots of music. And they thought, we, we've made it. We've accomplished it. This is the city of prosperity. We got goods to sell that nobody else has got. We got banks that are full of money. And we're going to enjoy this. They thought prosperity was happiness and well-clothed was happiness. You know what? Sometimes when we think that uh, we, really, uh, we really want something or we really have something, and it takes a kind of a tragedy almost to make us see that it really doesn't matter. Uh, my brother, Gene, who's uh, about two and a half years older than me, was a medic in World War II. He was on the front line with Patton 
for seven straight months. And he said, everybody prayed when the shells fell. Everybody prayed. He had a Jewish captain. Somehow, he and this captain got behind the German lines. And they didn't, uh, they didn't know how to get back. And they're running down a road, and the Germans are on a hill with a big gun and, and trying to kill them. And they're dropping shells all around them, and they're running for their life. He gets shrapnel in his leg, but it's not fatal. And uh, that night they found a house, and they slept in that house in the bedroom upstairs. First night they'd been in a bed for months out of the cold. And uh, they slept that night, stayed there hoping that their uh, division would catch up with them and they'd get from behind the German lines. And when it got time to go to sleep, uh, my brother said, I'm not sleeping upstairs tonight. And he said, why, why? He said, I don't know, I'm just not sleeping. They took the mattress and uh, they took it down the basement. There was water, some water in the basement. They propped the mattress up, and they slept. And that night, while they were asleep, a shell hit that uh, bedroom where they were, and nothing was left. The whole corner of the house was gone, bed and everything. That captain was a Jew. He would not let my brother out of his sight. I mean, he, he went with him everywhere he went because he believed in his God. He, he fought in one of the winter, winters in Germany, rains a lot and snows a lot in Germany. And he said those big shells would come in from the German army. And they'd drop on them, and then they would explode and burst and throw steel shrapnel in every direction. And said, when you knew those big guns were going to fire those shells like a bomb, he said, you, you got in a foxhole, and you didn't get your head above the ground, and you stayed in that foxhole and he said some of them had water in them, and it was winter. But he said, you got in there anyway, and you kept your head down below that. And he said to me, son, everybody prayed. You know, sometimes it takes some tragic things to wake us up to the values of living for God and serving him. But he's the God that will bring us through the valley he can bring us through the tragedies. He can bring us through the disappointments, the deaths, and the sickness, the sorrow. He can bring us through there with victory because inside all these things shall pass. These things shall pass. But the name of Jesus will never pass. Prosperity blinded these people to the need for God. And God said, you think you're rich, but you're really not. You're poor, you're rich, you're blind, you're naked. You see, we can enrich our living naturally and be impoverished spiritually. A worldly successful man may be a spiritual welfare. The Bible says if he gains the whole world, the whole world, he can have a private ship and a crew, a private jet with his own pilot. He can live in a mansion. He can go south in the winter and north in the summer. He can live and do whatever he wants. There's nothing that he wants he can't have. If he's got all of that and he loses his soul, he is a poor, helpless creature. Amen. Amen. Uh, Revelation 3.18. And I counsel thee, he's talking to Laodicea, buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich and white raiment. 
He's not talking about natural gold. That you may be clothed. And that the shame, well, you got on beautiful garments, a tailor-made suit. Yeah. That your shame of your nakedness, nakedness do not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you can see. Said what you're making won't do the job. The beautiful garments, they don't cover your nakedness. Pay the price for white garments. The eye salve you produce will not affect spiritual blindness. And then the 19th verse. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. As many as I love. Did you ever have God bring you under conviction? Oh, yeah. Lots of times. See, the best athletes are given the toughest training. And sometimes if you think your lot is a little more severe in the battle than other people, don't worry about it. You've got the special attention of God. Just hang in there. The best students are given the most demanding task. To be disciplined by God is a compliment because he cares. Get excited about Jesus. Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if a man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. What a scripture. What a scripture. It said you're neither hot nor cold because you're neither. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I can't stand the way you live. And yet, though they were this way, he said, cover your nakedness with white raiment. Get the true gold of heaven in your heart. In spite of the condition and your spiritual uh, status that you have, I stand at the door. I have not rejected you. You're going to make that decision yourself. I'm not making it for you. If you'll open the door, and let me come in. I'll spend time with you. I'll take the main meal, the evening meal, and I'll leave a lingering presence because I'll be there without haste. But the latch is on the inside, and Jesus Christ will not force entry into your heart to make you a spiritual person. He just stands there. Behold, you're not, he, he didn't have one good thing to say. In every other of, of the seven churches, he had at least something good to say, but not to Laodicea. And yet he said, I'm still here. I didn't reject you. I didn't go away. If you'll open, have an old-fashioned prayer meeting, get a renewal of God's spirit in your life. Get a fresh touch of the divine love from heaven. I will come in. And then the 21st verse. To him that overcometh, I will grant to set with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. You hear with the ear of the spirit and be a conqueror, not a loser. Amen. Amen. Stand with me, please. Let's come for prayer. Let's talk to Jesus. Just every time you get a chance, talk to him. If you're driving the car, you're walking down the street, talk to him. And if we'll listen, we'll hear his voice.